Margaret Thatcher is Britain's longest serving prime minister, the first female leader of the Western world. During her 11 years in office, she sought to change Britain's way of life and its position on the international stage. Both revered and reviled in almost equal measure, she bestrode the political scene, both at home and abroad, with a passion and in a manner not seen before or since. But who was she? And where did she come from? And how did she come to power, first as leader of her party and then as prime minister? <laughs> It's always supposed to be a tremendous ordeal, maiden speech, was it for you? Margaret Thatcher was elected to Parliament as the member for Finchley in 1959. Aged 33, an Oxford graduate turned lawyer, married with twins, Mrs Thatcher looked and sounded every inch the Tory lady. There's been universal praise for your performance yesterday. Talk of the front bench, how do you feel about that? Well, I think we'll just try to be a very good backbencher first. Certainly until these two are a little older, I couldn't take on any more political responsibilities. These responsibilities are quite enough. But this was no girl from the affluent shires. Margaret Thatcher was a greengrocer's daughter from Grantham, whose father, Alderman Alfred Roberts, had fostered her early interest in politics. Her father became the mayor of Grantham and was involved a great deal in local public life. And he took his daughter, his younger daughter, who is the one he obviously saw as, in a way, carrying on his tradition, almost a kind of son, with him where he went on public duties. So she was from a very early age, I think 13 or 14, sitting in on public meetings, watching her father conduct them, watching her father conduct council discussions and so on, and at the same time conscious of being very much loved by him. Marriage to a man of means had enabled Mrs Thatcher not just to establish a family, but to pursue her political ambitions. I think Dennis was uh, a very big uh, influence on her. Very, he encouraged her very much. He, he met her through politics, of course, and it was as a um, politician at the beginning of her career that they first got to know each other. Just two years after her arrival in Parliament, Mrs Thatcher was made a junior minister. Her promotion attracted much attention, though not necessarily for the right reasons. But what's it going to mean in your home life? Obviously, you're going to have to make some adjustments. I think it's going to mean even more organisation and method. I'm a great believer in those two things. But in any case, I could never do it were it not for the fact that my home is within 35, distance, 35 minutes of Westminster. Yes. I have an excellent nanny housekeeper, which helps immensely. But I see the children every morning, then they're at school all day, and of course I make a point of seeing and being with them at weekends. If you run all the budgets in a race called the high taxation stakes, I am glad to say that conservative budgets don't come in any of the first four places. Off to a flying start, Margaret Thatcher was then appointed to the shadow front bench as a Treasury spokesperson after the Tories lost office in 1964. The fourth prize to Callaghan in 1964. This chap Callaghan must go. But it was following the 1970 Conservative election victory that Margaret Thatcher really came to public prominence. As Education Secretary in Edward Heath's cabinet, she put an end to free school milk. I think the Labour Party decided very early on that they could hang this round her neck, Margaret Thatcher, milk snatcher. And she wasn't as tough as she later became. And I think for a period it had a very bad effect on her. The lady, the mother, who had snatched away the children's milk from them in schools. In fact, I think the proposal had been on the taffy in the Ministry of Education for some time. Uh, it wasn't a sudden revolution in policy. And uh, it um, wasn't really her fault. But having been dubbed by the Sun as the most unpopular woman in Britain, it was an early test of her mettle and character. The criticism she received over the whole milk snatcher business I think was very unfair, but it was typical of the time. 
when it was felt that the government's role was to support everybody from cradle to grave. And much of Margaret Thatcher's thinking and policy later was to move us away from that idea to spending public money only on what was necessary, education, and not on what people should be providing for themselves to a substantial degree, welfare, food for, for every child in the country, and so on. Um, she would have been quite upset about the reaction. And uh, Ted Heath was more than prepared, the Prime Minister today was more than prepared to let her take the blame, and indeed was on the point of dropping her. I suspect that some of that animosi uh, animosity uh, between Heath and Thatcher actually impelled her to stand against him in due time. Margaret Thatcher remained at education until the fall of Edward Heath's government in 1974. As such, she remained an observer watching from the sidelines as Edward Heath battled with the coal miners over pay rises. And as things started to fall apart in early 1974 with power cuts and the three-day week, she was almost certainly out of the loop when it came to the decision by Heath to call an election based on the question, who governs Britain? The resounding reply of not you saw Margaret and the rest of the Tories back in opposition. Despite election defeat, Heath refused to resign. But it was not long before his leadership was being challenged. And almost by default, the challenge came from a woman. She had not intended to be a candidate for leadership. Her man was Keith Joseph. Uh, and uh, she was really shaken when Keith Joseph uh, announced, for reasons which are well known, that speech he made in Birmingham, that he really wasn't the man to be Prime Minister. Uh, and uh, she actually said to me, somebody representing our point of view has to stand. So I will stand. Uh, and uh, she just felt that the party had to be off an alternative to Ted. Margaret Thatcher beat Edward Heath by 130 votes to 119. It didn't give her victory, but it did mean she had a head start for the second round. A lot of Conservatives wanted to punish him without pushing him out of the leadership and persuaded that Mrs Thatcher could never win. Quite a block of members of Parliament, Conservative members of Parliament, voted for Margaret in order to give Ted Heath a shot across the bows that would make him behave better. They didn't want to see him go, certainly not for her. So you fully expect your wife to be leading the Conservative Party, do you? I do. How do you feel about it? Delighted. Terribly proud, naturally, wouldn't you? <laughs> Heath retired from the contest. Almost immediately, four of his former allies entered the fray. In doing so, they split the vote. But even taken together, they couldn't catch Thatcher. She won by 146 to William Whitelaw's 79 in February 1975. When Mrs Thatcher followed, she looked as though she too was well content with the day's events. She's become accustomed to flash bulbs and arc lights over the last days, but after one last session of posing, called a halt. Six, five, four. Pleading a need to return to the committee stage of the finance bill and to tell Mr. Thatcher all about it. The old guard were totally shaken by her success. When she went to her first shadow cabinet meeting after she became leader, uh, I've often thought about this, she sat down at the table knowing that virtually every single person around the table uh, had uh, not voted for her. They'd voted for somebody else, or they'd been candidates themselves. So it was quite a facer for her. Margaret Thatcher had not expected to be leader of her party. She had once said that her ultimate ambition would be to be Chancellor of the Exchequer. But now, as leader, she was also aware of being an outsider, a factor that informed how she handled her leadership and her attitude towards her senior people, insiders all. I remember vividly her first appearance after her election on the dais at the end of the committee room to, to greet the 1922 committee, the assembled party. And there was a sense of history about it. I visualised it as this frail Joan of Arc-like woman arriving the Knights of the Shires on the platform beside her, looking deferential, and, and that was a change of mood and attitude. I don't think there was much sedition rumbling along. There were obviously some disappointed folk, uh, 